Well, we're really glad that we have this wonderful crowd here. Um, you should know that this weekend is a very special weekend for the Cooperstown Graduate Program. Not only is it the Bruce Buckley Lecture, but this weekend is our celebration of our alumni and our new building. Um, I would like those of you from our community to know that the Cooperstown Graduate Program started in 1964. Um, and it's, it's a very rare occasion when we can get those members of that first class, those pioneers who had no idea if the graduate program was going to be successful or if it was going to last for more than a year. Um, those folks, those pioneers, um, we, we tried to get a bunch of them to come back to hear their colleague, Henry Glassy, um, and there are five members of that class, and I'd like them to stand up. Because the Cooperstown Graduate Program has enriched this community for almost 50 years, and we're really excited to have this. to honor Bruce Buckley, who was the first dean of the Cooperstown Graduate Program. And Bruce was a folklorist and scholar who came from Indiana, uh, taking a chance on this brand new program. And then he sent his students out into the Cooperstown region to measure buildings and gather stories and collect cultural artifacts and conduct field work. All of those things are still housed in the library of the New York State Historical Association. I'd like to say that this is probably the best documented region in the entire country. <laughs> um, the topics that they collected ranged from traditional crafts and architecture to, as I recently found out, thanks to Amy Drake, sexual practices and music. So all kinds of things were collected um, by the students uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and um, since uh, 2000. The lecture, the Bruce Buckley Lectureship honors this tradition, and each year we bring a prominent folklorist to Cooperstown to give a public lecture and to share his or her wisdom with our students. The folklorists selected for this honor have distinguished themselves in professional careers in the Buckley tradition uh, for the attention they have given to the preservation of our cultural patrimony, um, their scholarship, and for their exceptional service. Um, we have two former Bruce Buckley scholars with us this evening. Eric Chittenden and Elaine F. So, thank you. And here to introduce tonight's Buckley lecturer is Dr. Elaine F., who was the very first recipient of the Bruce Buckley Lectureship Award. Elaine? Thank you. All right, I promise to be brief. I know. I know why you're here. You're in for a great treat tonight. But this is why I'm here. And as Dr. Glassby said to me, oh, you're reading the classics. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Henry's 1968 Pattern in the Material Culture of the Eastern, Material Folk Culture of the Eastern United States. This book was handed to me in the mid, in about 1973, by somebody who thought they kind of understood what it was I was talking about and what I liked doing and what I was interested in. Um, little did I know that within a year or two years, I would actually be following Henry Glancy's footsteps at the Cooperstown Graduate Program. So you may want to buy vernacular architecture. You may be stimulated tonight by um, his remarks. You may have all read um, uh, Folk housing in Middle Virginia, but start with the classics. <laughs> the culture of the Eastern United States. And there's a real reason, because Henry has been writing. Um, he's been writing about place, he's been writing about people, and he's been writing about living traditions um, for decades. He has been writing from his heart. He's been writing about what he loves and about what he sees. He's probably one of the most um, impressive observers of the landscape and what people do with the landscape. Um, the beauty of this book and um, his earliest books is that the illustrations for the most part are all his. Uh, the line drawings are incredible. 
so go back in time. Um, Henry has been uh, a first uh, and continues to be the first to do many, many things. He was actually the first state folklorist, although we know there was another folklorist before him, but there's a story there, um, in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, he was actually on the ground floor of the Smithsonian Festival of American Folk Life. He was a founder of Pioneer America, the <coughs> Conner Prairie Museum, um, and both the museum in Ulster and in Middle Virginia. Um, he came to Cooperstown, um, as he says, he was one of the young ones, came right up, talk about a gamble, came to this fresh program. Um, and from here, he set um, New York State afire with his, with his, with his researches. Um, he went from, uh, from here to do, do the same, but times a thousand in Northern Ireland. Um, he continued to do the same in Turkey, in Bangladesh, in India, and Brazil. Um, and his latest um, work takes him from the streets of Philadelphia to the streets of Nigeria. Um, Henry actually uh, came, went from Cooperstown to the University of Pennsylvania, um, got his PhD. And I happened to follow him there too. Coincidentally. <laughs> 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 Um, he never went to India, however, um, where, and he has really devoted a great part of his life. Um, I was lucky enough to be a student at Penn, and so many of us here are his students, um, if only by the books we've read. Um, he is probably one of the most elegant writers. Um, his prose is, is really um, just a gift. And um, I kind of just want to read one um, series of words from a review from his monumental tome. And when you read about Henry's works, they're always referred to as monumental. Not because, one, because of the content, but also because of the sheer weight and size. Um, the 872 page uh, Passing the Time in Battle Known about uh, life um, and art in uh, uh, Northern Ireland was described uh, by the New York Times reviewer about, it is about night and day, talk and work, man and nature, history and folklore, text and context, truth and order, art and culture, life and death, the ponderable and the imponderable. So I give you the gift for tonight, Henry Glassy. <laughs> Happiest moment. 
It was the first year, therefore things were unsettled and experimental, which was wonderful. A very interesting group of people were drawn together, and some of them are in the room tonight, old friends. There was a wonderful group of people to teach us. And they didn't yet know that they shouldn't be as serious as educators as they were at that time. You slowly <laughs> learn by teaching more that you simply can't give that much time to the students who simply, as my old professor Fred Diffin said, suck your blood. <laughs> but in the beginning, when it's exciting, you want to give all you can. And let me tell you that Bruce Buckley gave all he could to me. He was a wonderful teacher, a good singer, a scholar from Indiana University. But most important for me, he was a tremendous and unbelievable support. I remember sitting in his backyard. Mona was inside, probably making iced tea. He was sitting in the backyard convincing me that I was old enough to give a lecture at a professional scholarly meeting. I didn't think so. He did, and he pushed me around. That was good support. I had Bruce Buckley, and to think that he is the person after whom this lecture is named and I get to give it is really quite thrilling. To have seen Mona again today is quite wonderful. Bruce was a tremendous hero in my life. He was the leader of the folklore side of the program, but there was also Lou Jones, who had written a great book on ghost lore, great expert on folk art. The two of them seemed to look at me with amusement, but nonetheless to be, as I say, tremendously supportive in Frank Spinney, Minor Wine Thomas. One of the reasons this picture is on the screen is because it was taken very near Per Goldbeck's house. And Per was the person of my heart among the faculty. I admired Bruce tremendously. But Per took me in a different way, drove me forward, and he was a tremendously important not so much an intellectual leader, but a kind of pal, a friend who really helped me. And so that this picture, taken near his house, near Wigsmore Corners, is there on the screen as a, as a relic of that time. It's also on the screen because it's a perfect example of the idea of vernacular architecture. That is, a salt box interior rammed into a Greek box to which a <laughs> Gothic addition has been made in some way put in a tie in a tower. <laughs> if you think in the 21st century that you invented the postmodern, <laughs> here is Wiggs Corner postmodern in the 19th century with a fine old Buick parked next to it. <laughs> the fact is this is a perfect instance of what vernacular architecture is. And therefore, it leads into the talk that I want to give. And I've chosen this topic. I had others that I might have thought of. But I chose the topic for vernacular architecture because I am told that some of you have actually had, been subjected to that book that I wrote about Eugene. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought that there could be at least this, the possibility at the end of this rant for some seriously hostile questions. <laughs> yes, it it's yours. The next reason that this picture is here, and that I've chosen to talk about vernacular architecture, is precisely that vernacular architecture is the one topic that connects my time at Cooperstown to my time today. I was very interested in the 1960s in this topic, and I'm very interested in this topic today. So what I'm going to do is to talk to you about the historical importance of vernacular architecture. 